Let us stand for the scripture reading this morning. <clears throat> it's found in Luke 19, 28 through 40. <clears throat> After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethany and Bethany at the his at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. You not untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Tell them, The Lord has needs of it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner asked him, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the cloth, on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near to the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Distinguished, did I turn it on? Let's see. Oops. Let's try that again. <laughs> Distinguished lawyer and theologian, the late William Stringfellow, pulled no punches when it came to holding the church accountable. He was particularly verbal about Palm Sunday, claiming that Christians go to church on Palm Sunday because they like a parade. I hope that Stringfellow was not accurate in his assessment, but I do have to confess there is something special about Palm Sunday, even if it takes a while to get the parade going. It has something to do with our children, from the youngest to the oldest, waving palm branches as they process to the front of the worship space. Some of them have absolutely no idea why we are waving palms. And some are a little bit shy, and others have waved those palms more than once, and they are waiting for whatever the big deal is about those palm branches. And perhaps some of the rest of us, too, are waiting for what the big deal is about the palm branches. Or at the very least, we are looking for the excitement and anticipation that Palm Sunday should promote as we prepare for Easter Sunday next week. So just in case you need a little bit of that, there are some extra palm branches. We have plenty for next year. Maybe if you need one, take one with you today to remind you of this. Now Jesus was not the one who made such a big deal about his entry into Jerusalem. According to Luke's gospel, as they arrived at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead into the next village where they would find a donkey that had never been ridden. Bring the colt back to me, he said, and if anyone asks why, say, the Lord has need of it. So the disciples do what Jesus told them to do. They return with the donkey. They put their cloaks on the back of it, and Jesus rides it down from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem. It was then that the crowd began to form. A multitude of disciples lined the road, throwing their cloaks before Jesus. They praised God joyfully with loud voices for all of the deeds of power that they had seen. Hear again those words. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heavens. Oh, it must have been exciting and wonderful and loud and loud the people were
were expecting Jesus to be their king, even though he was riding a donkey rather than a powerful and mighty horse. We know that he was riding the donkey in order to fulfill prophecy about the Messiah. And we know that riding a donkey was more an act of peace than of military might. And we know that Jesus was riding to his death. Much as we would like to, it's impossible to get to Easter Sunday without going through Holy Week. We wave palm branches today and we sing Hosanna, loud Hosanna. But in the back of our minds, we know what we know. Jesus will be betrayed, arrested, tortured, convicted, and crucified. And the question that no one wants to ever have to ask or even answer is, if I had been part of the crowd that Passover week, what would I have done? You see, some of the very people who were cheering Jesus on would be the same people who would betray him later in the week. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. says this about crowd mentalities. Crowd pressures have unconsciously conditioned our minds and feet to move to the rhythmic drumbeat of the status quo. Many voices and forces urge us to choose the path of least resistance and bid us never to fight for an unpopular cause and never to be found in a minority of two or three. In other words, it's just easier to go with the flow than it is to stand up for what is right. It's easier to be caught up in what everybody else is doing than to think about what it is that God would have us to do. On this Sunday before Easter, even when we know what is coming, and especially because we know that the outcome is a risen Savior, the question on my mind is, how do we live into that knowledge with faith and grace? Do we just follow the crowd? Or is there another way? The very good news for all of us this morning is that Palm Sunday and Holy Week is all about what Jesus did on our behalf so we can be in relationship with him now. I'm going to repeat that. Palm Sunday and Holy Week is all about what Jesus did on our behalf so that we can be in relationship with him now. During Lent, we've been exploring gifts from God that may come from or might be found in unexpected places. Today, we're looking at the gift of misfits. Now, who hasn't seen that, uh, those pictures where you have a whole bunch of, of birds and there's a cat that's dressed up like a bird? I mean, what doesn't fit here? What doesn't belong here? That's not the kind of misfit I'm talking about. I'm talking about the one who stands apart from the crowd in order to be more fully present to God. The misfit that is willing to take a stand. Earlier this month at Season Saints, Laura Leonard did a, a presentation for them on encouragement. It was a real inspiration to me. Her she showed a clip from the movie Sea Biscuit about a spirited horse who won the title of American Horse of the Year in 1938. And all of the characters in the story, the man who owned the horse, and the trainer who trained the horse, and the jockey that rode the horse, and even Sea Biscuit himself, all of them were broken in some way. And the narrator described them all as misfits who, by working and striving together, not only achieved success, but healed each other in the process. They healed each other in the process by what they did together. Are there misfits around us, people who are willing to step away from the crowd, who call us to our very best selves and help us to develop a deeper relationship with Jesus? John Bratton tells a story of an American soldier 
who had drawn remote duty. He had written home to his wife, telling her about his seven new friends whom he had developed a close relationship. I'm so grateful, he said, because in this isolated and barren land, a person could easily be driven to despair. And when his next birthday rolled around, there was a large package in the mail from his wife. When he opened it, he discovered not just one gift, but eight gifts, one for him and one for each of his seven friends. With tears rolling down his cheeks, the soldier said to his friends, that's my wife for you. His wife was a misfit who looked beyond the boundary of one relationship to see how her husband's friends were making his situation more bearable. She expanded the circle of her love to include the people who were present with him, and by doing so, she expanded their love for one another. She was a misfit. Now, sometimes the misfit is a spiritual friend or guide, a person who knows the joys and challenges of a life of faith and is willing to share his or her experience. But sometimes the misfit is someone who witnesses to the spiritual professional. Pastor Joanna Adams talked about a time in her experience, she said in the years that she had been a pastor, she had known some winning churches and very many winners within the churches. But one particular person came to mind. His name was Robert. He was an advertising executive on the rise in his profession. And every Tuesday night, he volunteered at the foot clinic for the homeless people who made their home in their church gymnasium. She said Robert was a snappy dresser. I think she said he was a natty dresser, but snappy. She pictured him wearing his crisp white shirt and his red suspenders, sitting on a stool in front of a chair where one of the homeless men sat. She said in her mind's eye she could remember him gently taking that man's feet and putting them in a warm basin of water and after washing them, he would dry the man's feet off. And then he would take an ointment and put it on the sores on his feet. She said it was hard to watch that, but even more difficult when the homeless person, the guest, would kind of surreptitiously wipe a tear from his eye because no one had treated him with such tenderness in a very long time. Pastor Adams once asked Robert why he came to the clinic every week, and Robert brushed her aside and said, I figure I have a better chance of running into Jesus here than in most other places. That's all. And she then said that as she watched Robert week after week, she was developing her own double vision she saw Christ in the stranger that Robert would serve, and she saw Christ in the one who was finding deep meaning in serving others. Those who just went to Honduras understand what I'm talking about. The youth who go and help and serve other places, including singing at the hospital the other day, know what I'm talking about. Jesus gave us the example of being a misfit who did not succumb to the status quo of the crowd, but took a stand to do what was necessary to serve others. And by his witness, we are enabled to do the same, to put other people's needs before our own, to expand our boundaries of love, to include those outside of our immediate circle, even to take up our cross and risk stepping away from the crowd in order to follow Jesus. Holy Week is just one short week in the yearly calendar, but it is the most holy week 
of the Christian year. For people of faith, it is the week full of challenge and promise. May we choose to travel with Jesus, mindful that there is something glorious beyond the cross. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.